welcome all of you this morning for our Battle Walk program. My name is Bert Barnett, I'm one of the park rangers out here. And as we are just now getting into the summer season, one of my tasks is to acquaint all of you with our Today in the Park brochure. And this has a variety, once you get past the advertisements uh, for the other things, our entire summer schedule is boasted up in uh, four pages here. So in addition to my program, uh, there will be other programs listed of uh, the availability. Every, anywhere you see a check mark on the Sunday column uh, will be a program as well as throughout the rest of the week. So please avail yourself of this brochure, which you'll be able to find at the visitor center uh, for free. So now that we've gotten the obligatory commercial out of the way, we are gathered here on Cemetery Ridge to take an expanded look at the role and function of the field artillery as it relates to the third day of the battle. One of the fellows who was out here on the Union line on the third of the battle and came through the West Point conditioning and the training and had a very professional eye, therefore, of the role that that particular branch of the service played was a fellow by the name of Tully McRae. And Tully McRae was a graduate of the academy just before the nation went to war. And he wrote the following many years later in 1896. He said, Gettysburg has been discussed from every point of view except from that of the artillery, yet every account of the battle refers to the effectiveness of that arm. In this battle, the whole of the artillery in both armies was fought for all it was worth and fully demonstrated the power and influence in battle of that arm when properly managed. I like that last phrase, when properly managed. And to a great degree, that goes not only to the terrain, but to the leadership as well of both sides. Because, of course, all, both armies have three uh, breakdowns, three functions, infantry, artillery, and cavalry. And as you go, the artillery is oftentimes looked over. Infantry has the drudge and the intensity when you actually go into combat. Cavalry, of course, has the dash and the glory. And artillery, therefore, is one of those that is kind of cast aside and sometimes known as a red-headed stepchild of the three combat arms. But here on the third of day, especially the third day of battle, especially, uh, it is going to get a chance to shine on its own. Quickly, to get into the why of that, we're going to take a quick look at the terrain features out here. Battle against north and west of town, off in that direction. The second day of the battle sees the Confederates have to continue to push forward, and therefore, after they have kind of split their own army, with some of it still facing the Federals against Culp's Hill off in that direction, trying to launch attacks over there, as well as extending the bulk of their army down along Seminary Ridge down in that direction, and trying to launch coordinated attacks against the furthest extension of the Federal Army, about two miles down in that direction against Little Round Top and the famed attacks down there, not being able to make a coordinated successful attack on that direction. Lee will attempt to try the same thing on the morning of the 3rd, but various factors uh, will drive that uh, desire out of his hands, and he is therefore not able to have that coordinated attack. So he will have to look at a secondary option, Plan B, if you will, and of course Plan B is rarely coordinated as intensely or as well as Plan A in any set of circumstances. So he winds up having to look at the terrain at, as it exists. And as we sit here, as we stand here on the northernmost portion of Cemetery Ridge, straight across the way there, we are about 40 feet above the bed of the Emmitsburg Road, as well as a very clear vision. The landscape is pretty much the same as it was at that time of the battle. And if you are a shooter, if you are somebody who uh, you know, takes firearm in hand to target shoot for whatever. You're not looking right here just at an open field. You're looking at a very good range because you can shoot uh, down and across into the open out there. And that's one of the reasons why James Longstreet, the Confederate commander of the First Corps, was hesitant about this. He was very right in one sense that uh, this was a very bad position to try and come at. 
but Lee was very confident, the confidence perhaps born of desperation, that if he was able to overwhelm the federal position by use of the most powerful of uh, military technologies at that point, the artillery, that they would still yet be able to crack the center of the federal position out here, and that would give way, allowing the infantry of the Confederates to make way, break in through here, a mixture of old technology, of old military uh, practice and new. And that's what he was hoping would be able to allow him to claim victory on the third day of battle, as he had been unable to do on the first and the second. So I want to talk a little bit about that technology. We have a couple of pieces out here, but I would rather go to the ones over here because these are a little bit uh, better. The others have actually been altered a little bit. We don't want to get into that right now. Yeah, Revere, just like the Revere Copper Company that made the uh, copper bottom pots mm -hmm. uh, popular in so many kitchens in the 50s and 60s. Uh, Still. I remember my mother having a yep. couple of those as well. But the Revere Copper Company made the bronze 12 pounder Napoleons that would have been a third of the Union artillery and very prominently in the Confederate artillery as well. You have two types of artillery in this era. You have what's called smooth bores, which is like what this is, smooth like a drain pipe on the inside, and it is capable of throwing 12-pound uh, solid shots, 14-pound shells, and 16-pound uh, case shot, or uh, spherical case in this case, uh, from this distance from Cemetery Ridge all the way across to the tree line of Seminary Ridge and somewhat beyond, just a little bit beyond in this case. And artillery in this era is good for defense. It is good for holding terrain. And when the Federals had been pushed back through the town up into this, they had been able to establish successfully a position and hold it to a great degree by use of supporting their position with artillery. Now, again, all of this is very direct fire. There's no visible mount at this point on this gun uh, for a uh, breach sight, but if you look at the front right there near where your hand is, you can see the little uh, dot right there, which would have contained a threaded uh, front sight, but a front sight, and if you don't have it on here, oftentimes they would use one on here uh, for or a breach sight that actually uh, rests across the top of here and then remove just before the gun is fired. But you have solid shots, you have those two types of exploding ammunition, and then you have something called a canister. Canister is good for close range ammunition. Uh, basically, it's a giant shotgun shell, and in the case of the smoothbore guns, you have uh, the canister consists of 27 golf ball sized iron balls, and I've got one way down buried in. something about like this and if the enemy is coming at you and of course you'll notice also there are no shields around the barrel you know if you're familiar with the local VFW uh, you know, hall uh, it will have shields around it uh, to protect the gunners from small arms fire uh, you don't have that the only thing you have is the ability of your gunners to stick to their uh, assigned responsibilities and keep loading and firing the thing of course, every time the thing fires, it's going to roll back, and so the gunners have to adapt, roll back, and maintain their positions with this. Ideally, when you're shooting at long distance, you want to do that about one round a minute, so the manual says. But with this, you want to uh, be able to load and fire fairly rapidly to keep those projectiles going out. And when you're using the canister, you will just make sure that your number one man, the fellow right uh, on this side, about where you are, sir, uh, will make sure that you're working with the uh, number three who would thumb the vent, make sure that there's no air in here, sponging it out, making sure you kill all the sparks before the number two, where you would be right there, sir, uh, would load in the next uh, combined gunpowder charge and projectile before the number one man turns the spindle around and seats the thing in. What are you gonna do if the uh, air is still here and venting the spark. What happens to the spark at that point? I'm sorry? Ignition. Ignition. And if he's got two and a half pounds of gunpowder, uh, the projectile 
and his rod and his hand attached to that, what's going to happen to that? Bingo, he's not going to have his hand anymore, but that's okay because enlisted men are cheap and easily replaced. Uh, but for him, he's going to be out of the job. He will be known as Stumpy and play checkers on the courthouse square for the rest of his life and tell uh, a colorful tale. But it will not be effective as an artillery piece here firing against uh, the enemy. So that's the sort of thing that you want to watch out for. But at any rate, when a artillery piece is grouped with five others in the federal service, it's called an artillery battery. And these batteries have specified roles and functions. To attack and defend the works of temporary fortifications, to destroy or demolish material obstacles or means of cover, and thus prepare the way for the, su the success of other arms. In other words, if they're getting ready for an, ar for an infantry assault, you want the artillery to blast out uh, something out of the way. To break an enemy's line or prevent him from forming. In other words, on the 3rd of July, 1863, if you see uh, blocks or columns of men out in the field, it is the job of the infantry here on the defense to break those guys up, ruin them, and defeat them that way. To crush his masses, much the same thing to dismount his batteries. If they've got guns over there and we have guns over here, you can focus in, you can break up their guns, ruin their gun carriages, uh, make their uh, artillerists uh, unhappy. Yeah, just a gentle term. Uh, or follow and support in pursuit and cover and protect in a retreat. You're the last guys off the field because you want uh, your infantry to get ahead and you will be in the last part of the line to keep their infantry away from your guys that sort of thing. And like I said, this is a Napoleon. This is one of the differing types of artillery used in the Army. Again, the barrel weighs about 1,200 pounds. The whole thing, the carriage and everything together weigh approximately a ton. Uh, it will be linked to an, art, to an ammunition box with two wheels like this uh, called a limber. Together, the whole thing is pulled by six very impressive horses. And of course, the demand for horse flesh, by the way, during the war is tremendously impressive. And it will come to the point where they will have a very, very hard time. Remember, you've got not just this army, the Army of the Potomac, but you have the Army of the Cumberland uh, down in uh, Tennessee, and the army that's going to be going into Georgia uh, when they finish the Battle of Chickamauga down there a little later timeline-wise. But uh, you will have the armies that are going in Mississippi at this point as well, oppressing Pemberton and those folks. The demand for horse flesh generally in the United States will be such a demand that it will be very, very hard to sustain it uh, during that period of time. So all of this complexity means that there's going to be a tremendous respect for uh, what these horses can do when properly led, uh, as was mentioned earlier. Now, the first fellow that's going to come up with the need for this uh, in such an organized fashion on the uh, afternoon of the 3rd when the coordinated infantry attack that did not work out on the morning of the 3rd is going to be Robert E. Lee. He's going to realize that we've got to have something that's going to be able to break through the Union line and he will pass this down to a fellow uh, by the name of Edward Porter Alexander. Edward Porter Alexander will get the word uh, from his chief, who is uh, the Confederate uh, Chief of Ordnance, the Confederate Chief of Artillery, who I will mention a little bit later. But Alexander is going to be the source of a lot of this later on in the history. But Porter Alexander is actually only uh, James Longstreet, the first Confederate Corps. Uh, reserve artillery chief, but he will write it later. And, our, and Alexander is a very smart cookie. He's actually a very high graduate in the 1858 class of West Point. But uh, he will tell you uh, about what it is. He says, my order for as follows. First, to give the enemy the most efficient cannonade possible. It was not meant simply to make a noise, but to try and cripple him, to tear him limbless as it were, if possible. Then further, I was to advance such artillery as could be used in making the infantry attack. So that's what they're going to do. And they're going to utilize the fact that this is, in fact, what they call field artillery. Notice these things have wheels. 
If anybody's ever been to a military fortress of that time period where they have what's called garrison artillery, where you've got these big honking artillery pieces that sit on carriages that do not have wheels, uh, these things are designed to roll them out on battlefields. And that's how you can support infantry by as the infantry moves forward, the artillery pieces can move forward as well. Be fluid on the battlefield. And that's uh, what Alexander is speaking about here. Now, we are in the area that's going to feel some of that when the bombardment actually begins at uh, roughly one o'clock in the afternoon. Now again, turn your attention across the way over there. If you look right over there, you can see that monument right over there. That is the Virginia Memorial. And a lot of folks, when they talk about how many guns were involved in the bombardment on the afternoon, of the third from the Confederate perspective, they come up with the uh, erroneous number of 85 because they talk about the number of guns in Longstreet's Corps on the southern end over there. And if you look right over there, you'll be able to see that tower that's poking above the trees. Well, that's about where Longstreet's Corps is. And then they will talk about coming up in this direction. And Longstreet will be joined with uh, two portions of AP Hill's Corps. And of course, you will have guns in AP Hill's Corps. But what Lee envisions for this bombardment on the afternoon of the 3rd will actually involve guns that are more to a northern portion. If anybody's familiar with driving the Battlefield Auto Tour and the Peace Light uh, up near Oak Hill or Oak on Oak Hill, uh, you will have guns up in that direction over there. Now, this is an era of technological change, and you will have things that are more developed than other technologies can make use of at this point. Uh, I see you, sir. You have a cell phone sort of device, you know, wireless, all that sort of stuff is coming in. Well, Radio Shack is closed in 1863, but when you use artillery now, you have something called a forward observer, a guy who kind of hunkers out in the field ahead of your own artillery so you can call back and call in target grids and things like this. Uh, my uh, great story from starting out in the Park Service was a guy who told us a story. I was doing an artillery demonstration years ago and uh, in the early 1980s actually and we finished the artillery demonstration and a guy came up and said uh, that he had been an artillery spotter uh, back in uh, Korea and this was, you know and he said that he was watching a group of Korean uh, North Korean troops come across a hillside and he reported these North Koreans and then he hunkered down and he waited for the whistle of the projectiles to come overhead and he waited and he waited and he waited and instead of the uh, little burst of dirt that would uh, wound some of the North Koreans eventually he heard this giant whistle like a freight train was being thrown overhead lengthwise and then the entire hillside disappeared in mass quantities of dirt and then his radio crackled to life and it was this is the USS Missouri have you any further targets over uh, this is what the role of a forward observer does but you didn't have forward observers in those days but my point is that over on Oak Hill when you go over there by the peace light you will see these very long and sleek black guns these are Whitworths that were imported to the Confederacy by the British and they were great if they worked right because you could throw a projectile five miles but you couldn't see five miles in those days if you're looking towards the virginia monument you're seeing roughly about a mile and then you've got this tree line and you can't see beyond that so there's no sense in having something that'll throw a projectile five miles if that's about a mile and you're blind beyond that so you've got to have technology that you can work with and this thing you know, throws a good projectile, 4.62 inches, and uses a burning time fuse to do that. You want to have it ideally adjusted about uh, where it throws that projectile, where it'll burst about 10 feet above, 10 feet in front of the mass of infantry soldiers that's going to come out of that tree line. And pretty much that's what the Confederates want to do as well. They want to knock the teeth out of the Federal position here because they can see us and we can see them. And that's what they want to do is break down the uh, guns on the Cemetery Ridge line before sending their 12,500 men off of Seminary Ridge and move in this direction.
and when they begin that bombardment at 107 because they have a couple of primer failures and the uh, igniters don't work quite right when that bombardment starts in mass one of the guys with the 108 whose monument you see right over there the assistant surgeon of the 108 will recall our artillerymen sprang to their post at once the six guns along the crest of the hill right here our artillerymen sprang to their post at once and replied with more than their usual pluck and spirit but they were rapidly being overpowered, worsted, and fairly battered out of existence. I could plainly see their caissons, the wagons back to the rear, being frequently blown up, horses rolled in heaps, tangled in their harness with their dying struggles, wheels knocked off, guns capsized, and artillerists going to the rear or lying on the ground, bleeding in every direction. Although nearly all the horses were destroyed and one gun of the six dismounted, which means a shot smacked right in front of the gun, popped the barrel off. Yet the gallant commander fought them until he had not a round of ammunition left except a few rounds of canister shot. So they were pretty well played out at that point. Now Woodruff's is Battery Eye First U.S. Large limbs were torn up from the trunks of trees under which we lay and precipitated down upon our heads. So even the misses, you know, the overshots, still wounded some of the guys. Men of the 108 behind them attempted to break, but returned at the, at the drawn sword of a lieutenant. They were also further shaken when ammunition left in piles by a gun was set off by a bursting shell. It was an appalling sight and to this day is a horrible one to think of from the writings of Captain David Shields, an aide to General Hayes, the division commander here. Now, it's not only this area here that's getting hit. Let's move up over this direction. Now, if you look over in that direction, over towards Cemetery Hill, there are about 35 artillery pieces. The numbers vary depending on whose account you read. But if you go into the National Cemetery now, you will notice that the artillery of the 11th Corps, Oliver, Ot uh, uh, Oliver Otis Howard's 11th Corps, had artillery that was capable of turning its way and looking down the slope to cover all of that open field through which the Confederates were going to come. And they were very much aware of that. One of the downsides for the Confederates, or for the Federals actually, was that they were capable of being hit from two directions. There were guns over on the Hanover Road, Confederate guns that could throw shells back towards Cemetery Hill. There were also guns on the northern end of Seminary Ridge that could throw shells in that direction. Basically, they could be hit from a two-sided direction, a crossfire. And so some of those guys began to suffer uh, pretty badly at that point. You know, Thomas Ward Osborne, the artillery chief for the Federals of the 11th Corps, commented on the effect of that crossfire. He said an Ohio battery, he made pains to notice that it was an Ohio battery, which meant that it came from the artillery reserve that came up in that direction, not one of the 11th Corps batteries. He said, an Ohio battery was sent to me. The battery had been under fire but a few minutes when information was brought to me that the men were throwing ammunition out of the chest into some timber to represent that it was expended and so retire from the field. I went to the battery, gave the captain in orders, gave the captain orders in some emphatic English and then left him. A few minutes later, several of the men called out, Look, Major, see the cowards. I did look and saw that Ohio battery with all the men mounted on the ammunition chest tearing down the Baltimore Pike. I never saw that battery again. Doubtless, the captain reported to the commander of the reserve artillery that he was in the hottest of the fight and that he and all his men were heroes. At all events, the great monument on Cemetery Hill stands today to the credit of that battery. And if you're in the cemetery, you'll notice the monument to Huntington's Battery. And that is 
the monument to which he refers. Uh, but in all fairness, again, they're trying out new technology, and the new technology they're trying out uh, is a particular uh, time fuse, and the time fuse works, as they will find out in the testing in 1864, roughly 55% of the time. Now put yourself in the shoes there of the poor battery commander. He's getting in the middle of a crossfire, and one out of every two gun, one out of every two shells, roughly, does not work. They're digging through the shells that do work, and the ones that don't work, they're not worrying about, and those are the ones they're throwing out. Captain William McCartney of the 1st Massachusetts Artillery of the 6th Corps, which comes up to that spot, which was a reserve battery there, says this command was ordered into position to relieve the 1st New Hampshire battery, said to have been out of ammunition. I collected from ground which had been occupied by said 1st New Hampshire battery, 48 rounds of 3-inch projectiles, perfect condition, 22 rounds having been found near the position which had been occupied by one limber chest. So that's what uh, the uh, spontaneous archaeology, if you will, revealed uh, about that. But that's the uh, that's what comes out of that. Interestingly, the tests that are done in 1864 are all collected in what's called Abbott Siege Artillery in the campaigns against Richmond when they actually do those tests about fuse. And it's the Schenkel combination case fuses uh, that wind up not uh, uh, showing which ones work and which ones don't. Now. What I'd like to do is have us get back on the trail. We're gonna go over there and because the terrain varies here a little bit and that's one of the reasons why different things are always gonna pop up in our vision relative to uh, what we can see about this artillery. Now the folks on the Confederate side are focusing on trying to break the center of the Union line. And so they're not necessarily interested on trying to crack the extremities of the Union line. <coughs> so they're not interested in going after a uh, little, little round top area down past the Pennsylvania Memorial. They're not interested in doing things over at Culp's Hill. So they're trying to uh, husband their resources for the primary center of the area. So depending on who you talk to post-battle, you're going to get varying assessments of how accurate and intense the Confederate bombardment was. Although, uh, all will agree that this is a major maximum effort by the Confederates out here. The acoustics of this are going to be very interesting. The acoustics of this will be uh, undeniable. The acoustics of this will be recorded in Baltimore, Maryland, where they will be able to hear the bombardment of the Battle of Gettysburg. Because of the thermal inversion that hovers over the mountains west of here, the echoes of the bombardment will bounce their way into Pittsburgh. You will be able to hear the bombardment phase of the Battle of Gettysburg this will be the loudest noise on the American continent until they test the atom bomb in the western desert in 1945. As far as the infliction of things, the Confederates are definitely driving to knock out the center of the Union line. There's going to be a lot of focus on the center. And of course, like anybody, some of the marksmen are a little better than others. And so there will be quite a number of accounts of overshots, not necessarily hitting the western ridge and the batteries along the western ridge. Some of the guys will hit a little higher. There's also a theory out there that says, well, the, Feder the Confederates thought the Federal Sixth Corps was back behind there, so they were trying to do, uh, you know, kill two birds with one stone, knock out the batteries over here, and with the overshots, try and take out the Sixth Corps behind here. Uh, I'm not so sure about that, but they do produce a fair number of overshots with the massive number of artillery shells they throw. And some of those overshots will wind up knocking into uh, General Meade's headquarters down here, the Leicester House and the Leicester Barn. One account goes this way. General Meade's headquarters, which is the smaller structure of the house closer to the Tiny Town Road. General Meade's headquarters received its share of destruction. One shell burst in the yard amongst the staff horses tied to the fence. Another tore up the 
steps of the house, another carried away the supports of the porch, one passed through the door, another through the garret, and a solid shot, barely grazing the commanding general as he stood in the open doorway, buried itself in a box by the door at his side. So uh, they will pack up their office there, move to the farm a little bit to the south. They're still getting massive quantities of overshots at that point, and they will decide at that point to move to the next hill beyond. Uh, you know, so they will uh, uh, head out uh, away from there. Now, another account's very interesting. Uh, again, they're hitting the same uh, area of uh, Meade's headquarters here. Army headquarters were visited with such a shower of projectiles that 16 horses of the staff and escort were killed before the officers could get away. There's a little bit of Keystone cops to this one. One officer, seeing his horse badly wounded by a piece of shell, rushed into the house for his pistol to put the poor brute out of pain and put two bullets instead into a fine uninjured horse belonging to Captain Hall of the Signal Corps and would probably have emptied his revolver as he was a poor shot had not Captain Hall personally interfered. So that gives you an idea of some of the chaos inflicted uh, when all of this iron began to rain down on Meade's headquarters and his staff. So we're going to head back up over here. You'll notice the immediate 10 degree difference yeah. as we move into the shade. You know, the generals know where the high ground is, the rangers know where the shady ground is. <laughs> and unfortunately, this proud, this particular program is somewhat bereft of shady ground on most occasions. So the Confederates are trying to overawe the Federals. They have a smaller number of guns. They've got about 262 guns altogether in their artillery. The only thing they've really got going for them at this particular phase of the battle is the fact that they've got a six mile long battle line, twice the length of the Federal battle line. But the Federals have the tighter battle line as far as the intensity of it goes. And so they're just going to have to sit and take it, but when it comes to trying to actually uh, make a solid defensible position at the latter phases of it, you're going to see how that's going to pay off uh, with their use of artillery. But in the initial phases of it, the Confederate artillery is going to come from a myriad of different positions. So the Confederates, again, from uh, Tour Stop 2, from the Hanover Road, uh, as well as the long concentrated line, uh, they will feel it from a variety of different positions. Now as far as coordination, as far as command structure, the Federals have it in spades because they have a really OCD sort of person running it from the top of the pyramid down. They have a fellow by the name of Henry Jackson Hunt out of Detroit, Michigan. He is a third generation West Pointer and he is very well organized. Unfortunately, he's not been treated very well by the cascade of different commanders in the Army of the Potomac. Some of them have treated him like a staff officer, but when General Hooker left, he sensed an opportunity to kind of wheedle his way into making himself a real corps commander. Some of the folks recognize him as such, some of the folks have not, but since the artillery is in all of the different corps, Hunt has decided, well, here's my chance, and I'm going to uh, push my way, and especially since Chancellorsville, the last battle before Gettysburg, was such a disaster, and he kind of got a, uh, a written authorization uh, stating that he has real core battlefield command. Hunt was born in 1819 in Detroit, graduated in 1839 from the academy, and uh, he has really done nothing else but play with the artillery since he has been uh, in the service. And he is the fellow who took the organization away from this uh, little brigade command to a division command of some sort to a brigade command, which means that there is a grouping of artillery batteries in each corps. And unfortunately, they are still underrepresented in the sense that a major general, a two-star general commanding each corps in the army will face down a or captain or lieutenant in some cases when the heat is on like it is right now. So when Hunt has just ridden down the line just prior to the bombardment saying 
it looks like we're going to be facing an attack even before the first shot is fired. If something happens, don't shoot if they start shooting their artillery. Now the fellow in command of all this area here, every time you see a clover leaf like you see right here, that's second core. When you see it in stone or bronze, you're only going to see one color. When you see it on cloth, it'll be red, white, or blue for the division of that particular uh, portion of the core. But the fellow commanding all of those clover leaves is a fellow by the name of Winfield Scott Hancock. He's kind of a tightly wrapped fellow, has a little thesaurus fairly about, about probably this thick uh, for obscenities for any occasion. He's that <laughs> sort of fellow. <coughs> and when the Confederates begin to throw their shells over this direction, first thing he does is he goes to a Captain Hazard, the fellow commanding the artillery for the Second Corps, and he says, by gum, I want my big guns going off if their big guns are going off. And poor Captain Hazard's now in a tight spot because he says, General Hunt told me not to fire until we actually have infantry in the field. And Hancock says, I don't care about that. Their big guns are going off. I want our big guns are going off. And besides, remember, Hunt's only a staff officer and he only has one star on his board. And I've got two. So what do you think happened? They didn't shoot. They did shoot. And of course, long range ammunition is precious. So unfortunately, unhappily, they began to shoot. And of course, if you are a corps commander, you are king, especially if you are uh, mentally challenged that way. Uh, anything you see is anything you own. And bear that in mind with Hancock because that will enter into the story a little bit later. So all of these batteries around here will begin to throw their long range ammunition uh, out into the atmosphere heading in that way. Was it ever clarified who actually had administrative responsibility? They're for still the working on that. <laughs> <laughs> Both in the past and in the, in the future. But during this time, one of the things that Hunt had done in the last 10 years prior to the outbreak of the war, he had ridden to all these different army outposts all throughout the nation and had uh, instructed army officers about the new pattern of training and operation for field artillery. And of course many of those officers had decided to wear gray outfits come the actual split up of the country. And one of those was a fellow by the name of Armistead Lindsay Long who was uh, an officer with Robert E. Lee. And so when Hunt begins to observe how the bombardment's going, you know, it's kind of like watching a teacher after graduation seeing some kid brought in on probation. You know, they're not doing quite so well, so is that a good feeling or a bad feeling? <laughs> and he would write later, Colonel Long, who was at that time on Lee's staff, had served in my mounted battery expressly to receive a course of instruction on field artillery at Appomattox. Once I saw him later, I told him I was not satisfied with the conduct of his cannonade <laughs> as he had not done justice to his instruction that his fire, instead of being concentrated, was scattered over the whole field. Remember those shells that had gone and hit Meade's headquarters in the back? He said, I remembered my lessons at the time and when the fire became so scattered, wondered what you might think of it. <laughs> I love this monument because it's so well detailed in terms of the roles of the four guys uh, right around the, around the piece. The fellow with the sponge rammer is the number one. His job is twofold. It's to clean the gun as well as to uh, actually seat the gunpowder and the projectile. This fellow who's on permanent military leave is the number two. His job would be on the opposite wheel, on the front left of the wheel. His job would be to take the ammunition from the number five, who's bringing it up in the gunner's haversack. And if it's in the case of a rifle gun, like you see the three inch ordnance rifle uh, on either side of us here, you have 
not only the ammunition but also the powder bag which is protected here and uh, the number one and the number three are watching each other very carefully notice the eye-to-eye -eye contact right there because that's when you're thumbing the vent to make sure that you've got a that good seal that we talked about earlier the number uh, 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 the number three right here this is actually the number four right here who's uh, uh, thumbing the vent making sure our cutting that air off. Uh, this fellow over here is actually, you can't see it on the detail of the brass, but he's actually stringing the lanyard out so that when everything is actually set, uh, you would also prick the vent with the uh, vent wire, open up the powder bag, and insert a small friction primer, which is a very small device. I hope I brought it in here. Basically, it's a, if you're familiar with a ballpoint pen refill, it's a ballpoint pen refill with a bobby pin uh, run through it at a right angle. And the ballpoint pen refill portion has a, f a fine gunpowder in it. And at a right angle, the bobby pin <coughs> is put through with a kitchen match compound where the two meet and you pull that across and the spark generates, ignites the gunpowder and it goes through the hole made by the made by the, by the vent wire, which is this, which always seems to get hooked through there, and opens it up, and then the, uh, then the whole thing goes off. But it all has to be done at a very coordinated effort uh, to make the thing go off. And that's how that would work. And you'll notice as this fellow here is down, uh, he can take care of two things, but as they drill and train prior to battle and between battles, the manual actually has pages that are frosted in a black design uh, in a section of the manual called Drill with Diminished Numbers. Yes, uh, cross-training is one of those things that they focus on so that you actually can uh, take it down to three people to do that. And yes, here I've got my... It's in a little thing so it's hard to get a hold of. But uh, there, is your, there is your friction primer to set this off. So it's a little different than the way they did it in the war with 1812 where you couldn't fire your artillery pieces in the rain. Uh, they've modified these so you can gleefully kill people in the mist and in the rain. <laughs> so, but that's why I do like that because it's got the, the good visual for that. And again one of the reasons why the monuments out here have only two guns per battery is because when the War Department decided to monument these things up in the 1890s. Remember, they have multiple battlefields to monument, and they only have a finite number of artillery tubes. You know, they've got to go Chickamauga, they've got to go Gettysburg when those battles were all taking place at the same time, and only a small number. So that's why in a case where you would have a battle or a battery of six guns, they've got to split the number of artillery pieces out here. You'll notice the red diamond on that monument right there. That's Third Corps, that's part of the ruins of Sickles Corps after the disaster of the second day, and some of those guys were flushed up here. Artillery does not work well alone because of all of the support vehicles and everything else. These are the, uh, that's a, by, uh, standing as it does by itself, that is a caisson. You unhitch the two-wheel vehicle with the pole on it, and that would be a limber by itself and you can see the limbers standing by themselves across the road so that's a limber by itself uh, behind the gun and when it's attached to the other two-wheel cart with the spare wheel behind it that makes it a caisson the three ammunition boxes together constitute the caisson and of course behind that you would have a battery wagon which would be a large rectangular think of a think of a refrigerator laying on its side with all sorts of pre-manufactured spare parts, both wooden and metal, so that if something was damaged during a battle, you also had a fair number of carpenters associated with a, with a battery so that you could replace parts uh, in the field if you found trees uh, or suitable wood that you could do that. Sometimes it took a day, sometimes it took a day and a half, depends on how badly the things were broken. But all that would require uh, nearly about 115 men and nearly that many horses for one company of artillery, nearly 100 men and six guns. So all 
batteries were not just six guns in a row nicely by themselves. They had a lot of organization, a lot of equipment, a lot of supervision, a lot of skill into the operation of a battery. But of course, when all of this is undergoing all of this bombardment, it needs inspiration. It needs to see people willing to risk themselves. Hancock would be out here, Hunt would be out here, and General Hunt uh, gave the following. He said, I now rode along the ridge to inspect the batteries. The infantry were lying down on its reverse slope near the crest in open ranks waiting events. As I passed along, a bolt from a rifle gun, which is their version of a solid shot, uh, it's just cast iron, but it's a long sort of thing, not a round ball. A bolt from a rifle gun struck the ground and just in front of a man in the front rank penetrated the surface and passed under him, throwing him over and over. He fell behind the rear rank, apparently dead. A ridge of earth where he had been lying reminded me of the backwoods practice of barking squirrels. Now, the battery that we're looking at as we look towards the Confederate battle line there is Alonzo Cushing's regular battery. And it had been under fire for some time during the day. In the very early morning, they had uh, suffered a little bit of occasional battery fire. Uh, what I presume that to be was the occasional position firing. You know, you fire at, a, at an enemy just to get the idea of just how far they are and what position you'll need later on when the fight gets more fierce. And one of the fellows uh, in this battery said, we replied to their fire and, and within five minutes an explosion took place in their line. The firing lasted about 30 minutes up to 11 o'clock. We engaged the enemy's artillery four times, lasting about 10 minutes each. But when the full-scale bombardment starts a little after one o'clock, uh, things get a little different. One of their shells will take out one of the limber boxes behind the battery. And a shell came right under the limber box and a poor gunner went hopping to the rear on one leg, the shreds of the other dangling about as he went. It'll also take out a Teamster uh, in Cushing's battery. And of course, uh, one of the bad things about uh, that sort of thing is if you get wounded the first time, you don't know what you're up against, especially with the medical procedures being the way they are at this point in time. If you recover from a wound and you go back in ranks, you know what you're facing. And that's what happens to the teamster that gets wounded in Cushing's battery here. He's partially disemboweled. He was previously wounded at Fair Oaks. And he starts looking up at his fellows. We could do nothing for him, and, of, and as of course, none of us felt like shooting him as he begged us to do. Finally, he got his revolver out of his belt and saying, goodbye boys, turned the muzzle to his head and blew his brains out. So, you know, these are some of the occasional scenarios you see while you're trying to fight the Confederates on the other side. Trying to figure out the best way to, to do this because as we came to this point, you passed those two Napoleons right behind you. And one of the things that's kind of confusing about this uh, is our friendly neighborhood government. <laughs> because how many of you used to be children? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Well, we still are. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things about the way they monumented this battlefield was there was an understandable desire to pay homage to the people who were here right at the crest of the crescendo of Pigott's Charge. And if you weren't here at that particular moment, they didn't put your monument right there. And those two green Napoleons and the monument to which they are attached, Battery B of the 1st Rhode Island Artillery, are on this side of the road. That incurs no disfavor. It merely reflects the fact that Battery B, 1st Rhode Island Artillery, was kind of blown away in the first phase of the bombardment. 
And anybody here from Rhode Island? Nobody here from Rhode Island. Okay. Uh, in the lobby of the Rhode Island State House, there is a cannon that once stood just across the road in the sun right out there. And on the 3rd of July, that was a bad place to be because not only could you get shelled from the position of Longstreet's guns to the southwest, also before the trees in the cups of trees were so intense and so built up with the hardwoods that are there now, the Confederates had a fairly impressive grouping of rifled artillery pieces up to the northwest and those guns were pretty effective at shooting to the southwest kind of trying to catch everybody in the center in a crossfire and as a result in the area right in here Battery B First Rhode Island was in a very bad spot and as a result a number of their gunners began to get hit pretty effectively. One of the fellows writing about that particular battery in its exposed position on that slight knoll that you see there recalled the following. Billy Jones and old Mr. Gardner, Alfred G. Gardner to be specific, were killed. They were the number one and the number two man out in front. And my number three, who was at the back, the guy with the thumb, thumbing the vent, were wounded. And when he was wounded, a fair amount of his arm and shoulder were tore off. And he went dancing to the rear going, glory to God, I am killed. <laughs> so the fellow who wrote this, J.M. Dye of the 140th Pennsylvania, stepped up and covered the vent by tearing a piece from his shirt and putting a rock on top of it. He then went and tried to load the gun. He couldn't do a real good job of it because the shot that had killed the number one and the number two man had actually smote the very front of the barrel. And there was a ding on the muzzle. And that meant you couldn't get the ammunition into it because it displaced the, the completely round. And so he figured, well, let me do this. He pushed the powder bag in, he tore the thing off. Now normally on a 12, on a 12 pounder, the powder bag and the shell are together. So he had to cut the strings, push that in with the rammer, and then tried to get the ball in, but he couldn't get the ball in. He got it only a little ways in and it stuck. And so continuing here, while well, the sergeant swung on with an ax, so they tried to hammer it in. Now think about this for a minute, but this is the chaos of battle. If you're going to have to hammer it in, it's going to be real tight getting out with all that gunpowder behind it. That's not a really good thing. <laughs> I had to hold it in on account of that dent in the muzzle made by the rebel shell. Someone came on, and as we were going to make a strike with it, a rebel shell struck the cheek, the side panel right under the, the middle of the barrel, and it exploded, knocking out a spoke in the wheel. This raised the gun up on, an, on the other wheel, but it did not dismount it. You would think at that point that they've got your number. You know, they've already hit it on the front, on the front of the barrel. They then hit it on the side. This put a stop in trying to load it. The gun in cooling had clamped onto the shot so that we could not get it in. And the gun went to the rear with a shot stuck in the muzzle. They figured they'd let the, uh, uh, the blacksmith take a crack at trying to take it out later on. Loaded. Yes, loaded with the powder behind it and the shell stuck in the muzzle. Now, they figured they'd reuse it later. However, everything would transpire along Cemetery Ridge and the angle and the cops of trees and everything else here. But of course, Gettysburg becomes such a uh, significant victory that the gun does not get put back into service. The gun becomes a trophy of the victory here. And so the gun becomes something of an inspiration. They get it taken on a bond tour, if you will. And it goes eventually to the Treasury Department. It goes to the War Department. And eventually, <coughs> it gets returned to the State House in Rhode Island. 
with of course with the ball still stuck in the muzzle <laughs> which means the powder is still in there bingo the powder is still in there now considering it's been to the treasury building it's been to the war department imagine <coughs> some you know big bellied pompous politician sort nice watch chain the whole nine yards ceremoniously extinguishing some glowing cigar into the vent of this thing <laughs> amazingly that never happens but come the centennial in the 1960s somebody reads up on the history of this thing and goes you know this probably loaded <laughs> they take it off to some army facility and you know uh, scope it and sure enough there's this whole clump of stuff in the barrel and of course because two men died putting that ball in place they decide not to remove the ball but instead under the center of the barrel they will drill a small hole and between the vent that's already there and the small respectful hole they drill they flush it out and render it safe and if you ever get up to the State House in Rhode Island, I urge you to take a look at that. Because it's in the original, it's on the original carriage and you can see the broken spokes and the dent on the cheek piece and the whole nine yards and that's really something. And in 1988, for the 125th, they actually brought that gun and set it right back out on that field. And that was really cool. Now we're getting down into the area here. The fellow you see on the monument to my right there is John Gibbon. Gibbon was born in 1827 in Philadelphia. And there's a lot of North Carolina lineage in the Gibbon family. It's got three North Carolina brothers who go into the Confederate service, but Gibbon goes in and when the separation of the states occurs, he winds up uh, staying with the Union. He's also been drawn to the artillery and in 1860, prior to the outbreak of the war, he writes a fairly big thick book called the Artillerist Manual, full of all sorts of equations and technical expressions and all that sort of stuff, makes your head hurt. But when Meade has his <coughs> discussion with his officers, with his corps commanders and his division commanders, and Gibbon is the division commander for the 2nd Division of the 2nd Corps, the white cloverleafs, if you will. At the end of that discussion, General Meade and General Gibbon walk up from Meade's headquarters up towards the center of the Union line, towards Meade's post, towards uh, Gibbon's post, rather, and Meade says, you know, if the enemy does attack tomorrow, it will be on your front. And Gibbon says, if they do attack us tomorrow, we will be well prepared because of his eye as an artillerist. He knows what the artillery can do. But as the Confederates do begin to come up, as they begin to bombard this position, and Gibbon knows the strength of the field artillery out here. He also knows the inferiority of the Confederate organization. All the good artillery pieces the Confederates had stolen in battle on the 1862 year. Now there's an old joke as one of the uh, uh, Federals, uh, as one of the Confederates is being led uh, back after being captured in a battle in 1862, being led to the rear he sees, you know, all of us guns got them U.S. on them too. <laughs> but when the Confederates are beginning to plan their maneuver, beginning to plan how they're going to break down their line, if you look back over in this direction, <coughs> you'll see the end of the you see that white barn, that white house and that red barn. The end of the Confederate line 
will be between that red barn next to that white house and the red barn a little bit further to it to the left. As the Confederates begin to descend that little bit of a slope coming down in this direction, they are now going to have their line exposed and all the artillery at the end of the second corps and Pettit's battery here, the New York battery with these rifles here are going to be the end of that second corps. Now this is the end, Pettit's battery is the end of Hancock's legal authority as second corps commander. Hancock will be riding down in this area here too, but beyond the area of the Pennsylvania Memorial down here, he will ride down into this area and that's all going to belong to Freeman and Gilvery, who commands the reserve artillery. And there's going to be a, an interesting debate or two between Hancock and a couple of reserve battery commanders who are under uh, a different authority altogether. They're sitting there quietly because that's what they've been instructed to do. And uh, to be a fly on a tree somewhere and heard Hancock go off, blah, 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 why aren't you firing? Well, because we've been told not to fire. Hancock will get blue in the face, spit out a few more epithets, and say, well, I want you to fire. It's useless to, and you, to argue with Hancock. And so they will begin to fire at the mandated rate of one round per minute. Very slow, very predictable. Hancock, very pleased with himself, will turn around and head back up this way. As soon as Hancock is out of earshot, they will cease fire and thus preserve their long range ammunition. Meanwhile, back up this direction, all of these batteries will now have pretty well thrown away all of their long range ammunition and all they have is canister. That's going to make a big difference because while I showed you that big juicy iron canister cannonball, that's what you use in the Napoleons, in the bronze guns. In the iron guns, you have a lead marble sized ball, and because you're shooting out of a rifle barrel, like the beginning of what you're looking at at the beginning of the James Bond movie, it spirals, it spreads, it distorts, and it weakens. And that means that a artillery battery shooting canister of that sort has about a 200 yard range. And considering your average musket has a range of about 400 yards, <coughs> who can shoot more effectively at that distance? <coughs> musket. That's right. Your average enlisted man infantry guy. Well, it's going to be a very interesting thing. That's why Hunt will describe uh, his version of things a little bit differently than Hancock will. We'll get into that in just a little bit. But I do want to mark this down just a little bit. If you hear a whistle hit the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see the smoke to the right of the tree there. Yep. Yep. Now one thing, uh, when Gibbon is riding up and down the line here, he was taking due note of the projectiles that were flying overhead. And between the rifle guns and the smoothbore guns, he said the larger round shells could be seen plainly as in their nearly completed courses, they curved in their fall towards the Tawny Town Road, which would be behind you right now. But the long rifle shells came with a rush and a scream and could be seen only in their rapid flight when they upset and went tumbling through the air, creating that uncomfortable impression that no matter whether you were in front of the gun from which they came or not, you were liable to be hit. Now we are at the headwater, so to speak, of Plum Run as it goes down in that direction. And this was a very hot, very humid day. And on occasion there would be folks heading down that direction with canteens. And Gibbon spied one of those fellows who was very nervous creeping down there, almost crawling in the mud, looking for a thick enough portion of the creek to be able to fill one of those canteens. And of course there is Gibbon on his horse. And there's an interesting uh, back and forth between those two. You know, and uh, it, it is recorded that uh, you know, the uh, 
you know what went on be between that because the fellow looked down uh, at uh, the given look down at the fellow and said you know hello my man and the fellow was startled by the fact that given was there on his horse and saw given on his horse and was inspired enough to actually stand up and walk down towards the creek you know that uh, if he was there that uh, you know he ought to be able to stand up so I thought that was interesting now one of the things that uh, happens out here remember artillery by itself is vulnerable Rorty's battery the parrot guns that you see back here uh, at Rorty's monument now notice the difference between those guns uh, and you can see if you look uh, back uh, to them, maybe you need to get a little closer to this one over here, but I do like to point out these differences. Back end of that particular, of those particular guns? Yep. Okay. Uh, they are, those guns are made by a, uh, a founder up in New York, Robert Parker Parrott put together what was basically the Saturday Night Special of the artillery uh, during the Civil War era <coughs> because the entire length of that tube is cast iron. Anybody here familiar with the qualities of cast iron? Cast iron is the cheapest, most frangible metal that you can work with and it does not deal with pressure well so that cylinder on the very back end of it is wrought iron and they will heat up a uh, a ring of wrought iron and hammer it over the back of it to hold it together when it fires. So uh, it is uh, workable, but it's not the most reliable. They'll make that pattern from the 10 pounder that you see there up to a 200 pounder for coast effects. And in the 1880s, uh, with some age on them, they will actually begin to kill cadets at West Point as they continue to work with them at that point and be an object of some uh, criticism at that time. Actually, they'll have a couple, they'll have one 20-pounder parrot rifle over on East Cemetery Hill at first during the third day's battle. But they're you know, back here behind the infantry line on the third day. And how many of you have heard of the term friendly fire before? Okay. As they are shooting up in that direction to try and knock out that grouping of rifled artillery pieces that's been harassing the uh, Federal artillery line earlier. One of the first rounds fired by Rorty's battery was defective, exploding just after it left the muzzle and cutting down Lieutenant Henry Ropes of the 20th. And the 20th monument is the what looks like the unfinished monument there, the pudding stone just to the right of the tree there. The unit defending the low stone wall in front of the guns. At the time, Lieutenant Ropes was seated and reading from a volume of Charles Dickens to steady his man during the noise. So. Uh, after the criticism that arises from that, they will take the battery and move it ahead of the infantry. A noble gesture, but it will also expose the battery to the uh, vulnerabilities of that position. So we're going to move up uh, over here. First of all, that low crude wooden fence uh, that you can see, basically if you see the big clump of unkempt bush, just in front of me here and a little bit further to the left you'll see that uh, uh, wooden fence and then to above it you'll see the section of white fence that uh, is along business route 15 there okay you'll notice that the terrain as it uh, goes beyond that white fence kind of slopes down <coughs> that is where a segment of the confederates uh, Kemper's brigade will cross there and then begin to pivot or the end of uh, Kemper's brigade will pivot come down this way because they have to maneuver around the large red barn that you see there that's the part of the Kadori property there uh, they will have to pivot come around this way and that will expose their flank to all of the rest of the reserve artillery and those folks because they have not thrown away all of their long-range ammunition, they will have a, a good time plinking away at the Confederates there. Meanwhile, up where we have already been, back in that direction, those guns will have nothing to shell or nothing that they can put into their guns uh, until the infantry gets close enough to use their canister. So this section of the field up here remains quiet 
as the infantry starts moving out slightly after 3 o'clock. So this is going to be a louder section of the field once those Confederates move across the Emmitsburg Road, pivot and start coming up this way. So it's going to be a, a little bit of a quiet time and this is why Hunt had wanted for all of the artillery along Cemetery Ridge to wait until they all had legitimate infantry targets in the field. And this will be the beginning of a giant spilt ink argument that will go until the 1880s. Even after Hancock dies, his second in command will pick up that argument and continue the debate <coughs> for years after that. You know, one of the fellows in the 19th Maine will write, all we had to do while undergoing the shelling was to chew tobacco, watch caissons explode, and wonder if the next shot would hit you. On the whole, it was not a happy time, a massive understatement. Uh, for one, I felt a great relief when the enemy skirmishers appeared. We're going to head up here. <laughs> now again, drawing your attention from the left extension of the white section of fence at the top of the hill between that area and the white house at the crown of the hill. That's going to be the area pretty much where the end, the flank of the Confederates are coming from there as they begin to descend down into that way. You are going to have two batteries. You're going to have a heart 15th New York and you're going to have Phillips rifle battery that are going to be down along in the reserve area which is a little bit diff difficult to see but you can't do from there and here at the same time and stay in our two hour time frame. I have basically two programs woven into one here uh, but to do the regular two hour program I can't uh, employ everything at this point. But Francis Walker who is Hancock's chief of staff uh, will point out with the advantage so obtained have compensated for the loss of morale in the infantry which might have resulted from allowing them to be scourged at will by the hostile artillery. That's the, that's the argument that he raises about uh, you know, not being allowed to fire back from this position. Every soldier knows how trying and often demoralizing it is to endure artillery fire without reply. Now in that, uh, the voice of Edward Porter Alexander uh, comes in a with it with this viewpoint general hunt's orders not to reply for 15 or 20 minutes i am very sorry to say were immediately forgotten i hope he court-martialed every rascal of them for it afterward for all of us confederates might have enjoyed that 15 minutes but instead of giving us a beautiful exhibition of discipline his whole line from cemetery hill to round top seemed in five minutes to be emulating a volcano in eruption well that's not quite true uh, but this is one of the few places where Alexander kind of goes to not. Uh, although Alexander does, in fact, agree with Hancock on this point. He says, I rather too think that I concur with General Hancock's idea that the federal policy at Gettysburg should have been to keep their batteries firing at least as long as ours were, for they had superiority in number and caliber of guns and in quality and quantity of ammunition. Their policy should have been always to fight us to exhaustion if we would but give them the chance exhaustion would have come to us first. And that is very true because the Confederates were always at a, uh, a uh, short stick for the Confederates. Now, Alexander will continue. I began to notice signs of some of the enemy's guns ceasing to fire. At first I thought it was only crippled guns, but I discovered entire batteries limbering up and leaving their positions. Now it was a very ordinary thing for us to withdraw our guns from pure artillery duels but the Federals had never done anything of that sort before, and I did not believe they were doing it now. I felt encouraged to believe that they had felt severe punishment, for here was a new departure in their conduct. Now, one of the things that will affect how things move when the Confederates begin to bring their men out is the line, that line of ultimately 12,500 men is that by the fact that the time that Lee had originally envisioned for the bombardment was supposed to be 15, 20 minutes maximum. But 
by the fact by the fact that it's all going to be nearly two hours in length will drain all of the confederate access that they have to their ammunition at hand and one fellow that we have not yet mentioned is william nelson pendleton the confederate equivalent and i hate to use that word because it is not but uh, by rank the equivalent of uh, general hunt and pendleton is the fellow uh, that coordinates all of the confederate artillery however pendleton is an interesting sort pendleton is the fellow who graduates from west point in the mid 1830s and then after graduating from west point decides like many teacher like many uh officers do that he's going to spend a few years uh, teaching at West Point and what he decides to teach is mathematics and I will tell you that there is a the reason why your brain is cloven in two, into two pieces is that there is the logical part and there is the illogical part the religious part the poetic part uh, all these uh, artistic parts well there's a short in Pendleton's brain and he decides after teaching mathematics for a few years that mathematics are all logic and laws and all that sort of stuff and therefore the only one who sets laws in creation is the Lord and therefore he has found the Lord through mathematics and therefore he is going to take off his rank tabs and he is going to put a collar around his neck and he is going to become a preacher and so he will go into the Episcopal Church and he will stay in the Episcopal Church until the incense of secession whips past his nose and he will decide at that point that he must go back into rank and he looks for a place where he might be uh, of welcome there and he will decide at that point he wants to go into the artillery and he will find a way back into the artillery because he has been Robert E. Lee's pastor and he knows all of Robert E. Lee's secrets and so he will be able to uh, eventually become the chief of artillery for the Army of Northern Virginia and the problem with this is that he has missed all of the technical manuals all of the military upgrades all of those good things that somebody like uh, Hunt has been privy to and so he knows really not any of those things so he's commanding the artillery of the Confederacy out here so when they will try and find a way around that, it's going to be a different story altogether. Very sharp, mechanically uh, induced sort of things on this side, and not very much so on this side. So, uh, the Federals here, the Confederates, doing what they can. After that two-hour bombardment, and by order of Pendleton, all of the reserve ammunition is very much locked up on the Chambersburg Pike a mile away, Alexander will say we were halted by him for a moment by a fence because he's now gone back seeing what they can scrape out of the limber boxes on the active Confederate artillery line seeing what they can get any gun that's got more than 15 rounds in its boxes is now going to be collected and ordered forward in a very irregular line to support their infantry and as the men threw it down for this irregular line to pass I saw in one of the corners a man sitting down and looking up at me. A solid shot had carried away both jaws and his tongue. I noticed a powder smut from the shot on the white skin around the wound. He sat up and looked at me steadily, and I looked at him until the guns could pass, but nothing, of course, could be done for him. Alexander writes that same passage with nary a variation in three different accounts. Now, if there's anything as close to literary PTSD as I'm aware of, that's probably it. So what is a, uh, Pennington and Alexander, are they both, uh, they're obviously part of the um, cannonade, but who's really running the show? Well, Pendleton is the overall chief, but because of the... Uh, difficulty that folks have in dealing with Pendleton basically it's like having a dullard boss uh, and they will find ways to work around him uh, Lee will for the most part work directly directly with his core commanders his artillery chief core commanders <coughs> and there are a couple of people who write uh, accounts of uh, 
knowing that Pendleton is kind of out, you know, catching butterflies somewhere, uh, you know, that's an approximation, not actually a real quote, uh, while uh, the real meat of planning and attacks and things like that are actually laid with the uh, core artillery chiefs. And that's, you know, the same thing with, uh, with Alexander. The actual core chief of the first artillery corps is a fellow by the name of Walton, uh, who has the seniority in the first corps artillery, but he's born in New Jersey and a grocer in New Orleans, but by, by sheer seniority is the guy who technically commands the first corps artillery. But, you know, he's old, he's doddering, he's not young, vigorous, and up to all the speed, so he's not the guy that they, and uh, Walton will actually in the 1870s write a, a piece, you know, with kind of a whining tone to it, affirming, I really was the guy in command at Gettysburg. So, you know, it's, it's kind of an awkward sort of arrangement. But now back to the battle action. When the Confederates begin to descend that slope from the road forward, Captain Phillips of the 5th Massachusetts says, as soon as the rebel line appeared, our cannoneers sprang to their guns and our silenced batteries poured in a rain of shot and shell, which must have sickened the rebels of their work. I never saw artillery so ably handled or productive of such decisive results. It was far superior to even Malvern Hill and the massacre that occurred there in July of 62. And at this point, since you actually have our infantry in the field, everybody begins to get into the act. This is kind of the green light for the, uh, you know, shoot them if you got them sort of moment. And Lieutenant Rittenhouse up on Little Round Top with Battery D, 5th US, what was Hazlitt's battery on the second day, they get into it as well. Uh, in a report that uh, he writes, uh, Lieutenant Rittenhouse noted, uh, quote, two Irishmen who would rather fight than eat Peebles and Grady uh, will get into the work, quote, I opened on them with an oblique fire and ended with a terrible unfilating fire. Lieutenant Samuel Peoples pointed to the first, pointed the first to right piece and Sergeant Timothy Grady the second, both splendid shots. When the enemy got a little more than halfway out line, I could use only those two pieces as the others could not be run out enough to point them to the right, but Peoples and Grady tried to make up for the loss of fire from the other guns. Many times a single percussion shell would cut out several files and then explode in their ranks. Several times almost a company would disappear. Almost every shot pointed by these two men seemed to go where it was intended. So now the Federals are beginning to uh, make their teeth known out in the field. We're going to head up this way. Now in support, as I mentioned, in support of the Confederate infantry beginning to move out into the field, they did have a few batteries of limited means that could try and do what they could to help with the advance of the infantry. But because of those limited means, they were not able to do well, but they did incite responses from the Federals. I remember Captain Hart and Captain Phillips, a little bit further down in that direction, uh, were able to fire back. Captain Hart's battery uh, reports this. At the time, the enemy opened a battery on his right, meaning further down in Longstreet's uh, unit. They opened a battery in front of a barn, his projectiles killing many of my horses. I directed my fire on this battery and on his caissons, which were partially covered by the barn. Now they were in an advanced position. Again, drawing your attention to that white fence section right there. That marked the previous existence of the Rogers farm at that point in time. I candidly believe it was I who caused his caissons to explode and set the barn on fire. Had he known all the complete details, he probably would not have boasted quite that because the Rogers barn at that time was used as a field hospital that contained both federal and Confederate casualties. But uh, you write what you write. So. Again, as the Confederates now begin to push their lines back up in this direction, you're going to see action from a variety of different units coming up this way. Uh, one of the units is coming up, or actually is in kind of a 
uh, a loose position at this point because of their uh, condition after the firing on the second was Julian Weir's fifth C regulars uh, and they come up towards this direction and this comes from his report you'll notice it's the uh, grouping of Napoleons those two green battery uh, belt two green barrels uh, that you see right down straight down uh, in position there on taking my battery up and reporting to General Newton who was uh, from the first corps division uh, he said I was told that he didn't want light 12 pounders and was ordered to return to the reserve I had moved but a few hundred yards when I was halted and ordered to the front about the center of the line which at time was beginning to be pressed I was conducted to General Webb who commands the angle area here and came into battery under a heavy musketry fire I opened it once with canister so they're beginning to concentrate their forces both infantry and artillery up towards this area now I already made mention of what happened to Brown's battery the Rhode, the Rhode Island battery that took place in this slope here I want to take you up to what happened uh, now that the Confederates are coming on this side of the Emmitsburg Road And for those unfamiliar with it, this is the area of trees that are uh, inside this iron fence. It's known something as the copse of trees. Now, the copse of trees looked a little different at that point in time. We did not have these uh, pondering hardwoods that you see right now. Of course, if you were a farmer at that point in time and had to drag your plow in these long furrows across the way here, how successful would you be with these rock outcroppings? Not so would you have left them in tree and outcroppings where you could let your uh, your animals nibble uh, through here well that's what they did and the trees that grew up here were trees that extended over this area here so you had trees over in this area as well so there were trees all through this position and the brigade that was against the stone wall here Harold's brigade was posted down through here. Now, after the battery had been shot up, it was pretty much a ruin, pretty much a wreck at this point. And there had already been a cry to place another battery in this position. Artillery reserve was down in that area where you see the barn roof just sitting above the ground down in that area. So they got word that they need to put an artillery battery up in this position for some reason they did not put uh, fifth battery C here they went and got another battery and that battery is going to be Cowan's uh, six core reserve that they're going to put into this position but as they begin to do that of course it's a loud noise out here tremendously loud it's not quiet forever like we all are now but all sorts of noises going on and when those six guns of Cowan's are beginning to move up into this direction the Confederates are already closing up towards this area and the stone wall is all down through here and lots of things going on and General Webb is down here uh, urging his infantry to do what they can and there's going to be uh, considerable chaos moving all the different parts into place Armistead and his Virginians are coming up through this area here and when that penetration does take place very slightly uh, and uh, you know a couple hundred folks make it across the way over here Armistead comes in through here the Federals are going to order a reinforcement from that brigade up this way so they start coming up this way and how many of you have a big dog or a dog of any real size okay you come through the door Does that dog ever rush up to greet you absolutely okay well this is the sort of the scenario because when Cowan's battery is coming up this way their drivers are you know lashing them pretty well you know get up here get up here get up here and so you will have six guns pushing up through here but they will wind up behind the infantry and the infantry is rushing up to close this hole through the trees here and so the horses are behind the infantry the first team of horses pulling the first gun go right into the trees so you only have five guns along this slope to cover up where Battery B First Rhode Island was but they will turn 
position their guns along this line. You know, Cowan records this. He said, another officer shouted to me, report to General Webb on your right. I hesitated a moment as General Webb belonged to the Second Corps while we were serving with First Corps under Doubleday, but I saw an officer near the clump of trees waving his hat at me, and I saw that the battery was withdrawing. And that's a generous term. They were pretty well shot up. The officer was General Webb, and the battery was B, First Rhode Island, disabled and out of ammunition. However, when Cowan moves up here, quite a number of the infantry ran away through my guns. Was was a captain with a sword tucked under his arm, running like a turkey. <laughs> I swore at him as he passed me. I saw Corporal Plunkett pick up something from the ground and smashed it over one of the heads of one of the frightened boys. There was a big tin coffee pot, the loot from some Dutch frau's kitchen. The blow broke it in the bottle. I can still see that fellow running with that tin pot well over his ears. <laughs> so both my guns get into position. They begin to turn as the Confederates are coming up here because a brigade has a couple thousand muskets in it. A battery has how many barrels in it? Okay, so you think your odds are increased or reduced? Veteran infantry, veteran infantry think they are reduced. A large number of the enemy leapt up and rushed forward to capture my guns. A Confederate officer, followed by a number of men, crossed the wall, and I heard him shout, take the guns, as I shouted the order fire. Now, not just canister, but double canister at this point because you've got the heavily pressed Confederates here and the very motivated Federal artillery here. One tin can is 110 of those lead marble balls and you can place, because you're dealing with loose powder bags at this point, one powder bag, one tin can, another tin can on top of that. And that's what they will do. And we had two accounts. One says 10 paces, one says eight paces. And when that command double canister load is given, that's about the same time that charge the guns command is given. One letter says eight paces from when the, from when the lanyards are pulled. And a third account says when the smoke lifted, not a man was seen to be standing. That's probably a tad overplayed, but the effect is the same. It projects a pretty good dent into the motivation of the Confederates in this area. Now, a little bit to the south of here, you have two more brigades of Confederates that are coming up, but they will run into Hart's battery and they will run into uh, Phillips battery and they will get the same sort of treatment down there and the artillery has pretty well anchored, not just the center, but the end of the hard hit flank of the Federals here. Pretty much the center here, although one account that we do get from the uh, trial later on of the 72nd Pennsylvania, which is just up there. If you look up there, you'll see the guy leaning in very uh, masculine with the musket over his head, getting ready to swat the fearsome rebels as they come up. Uh, that's the uh, trial over whether they actually could put a monument in place, and the Supreme Court uh, said they could, even though the War Department said they couldn't, so guess who won? Uh, but uh, they, uh, they got their uh, permission to do that. Uh, when the artillerymen deemed it to be too close a fight, there's the uh, testimony that said a number of the men of the 71st Pennsylvania actually found enough junk on the battlefield along with one leftover powder bag in the limber box there to load it up and true John Wayne style if you've ever, ever seen any of those old fort movies where there's chains, broken bottles, rocks, all that sort of stuff they throw in the cannon. Uh, that's what they do there. They said a sergeant of the battery helped them sighted along the Emmitsburg Road and fired it before they were inundated with uh, Confederates coming along the way there. So that's what happens in that area. But uh, at this point in time, the, it becomes an infantry versus infantry fight and the artillery has pretty much done what it can. We do want to head up this way. It's hard to be two places at once. 
but when you have the intensity of the fight between uh, Armistead coming over the wall and dealing with the two pieces of Alonzo Cushing's 4th US that were still at the wall during the bombardment some of the 4th US had been uh, damaged at the end of the bombardment phase of the battle and that uh, eerie quiet right at the aftermath of that as the infantry begins to come out of the battle line forming that battle line beginning to move across Cushing took two of his pieces moved them down to the stone wall which again is two feet higher than you see it now actually they removed pieces of the wall to make way for the muzzles of the guns members of the 69th infantry were actually out in the rough ground in front they were real happy about that uh, because they found themselves loose infantry in front of the artillery and there were only a few pieces of canister left as a result of Hancock's uh, dictation to fire during the bombardment and between that and the fact that the Confederate optics were able to spot these uh, two artillery pieces out there and these guns therefore drew fire to not only the guns but also to the general area and there was a fellow by the name of Anthony McDermott who complained about that and then when the Confederates moved some of their guns out from the beach orchard and continued to fire on that position they weren't real happy about that either. But the canister that was left was workable until the last moment. And it was while the guns were being worked in their last moments that a Medal of Honor was won by the lieutenant who operated the battery here and he stayed with that particular piece, with that particular gun, and according to the accounts, uh, received three bullets, uh, one in the lower abdomen, uh, one in the mouth, uh, and one in the chest, and uh, that was an example of dedication. It took some time for that Medal of Honor to finally uh, be, uh, be won, but Alonzo Cushing uh, finally got his Medal of Honor. He had been given uh, the marker here to indicate uh, the position of his command of Cushing's battery here uh, some time back. But, of course, Cushing's battery is a reflection of the sort of leadership that was endemic in the artillery, both on the ground level, both on the Confederate and the Federal sides. And that goes back to the opening comment uh, that I started off with. Uh, was fought for all it was worth on the operational in the dirt uh, wheels in the ground level these guys did the best they possibly could now of course as far as the uh, management of it that was quite something else and that would be debated for some time but I do want to throw a few statistics at you just to give you an idea of just how intense it was right in the area where you are standing the losses in Battery A, uh, this is here, uh, uh, was right here. Out of 90 horses, we lost 83 killed. Not a sound wheel was left. Nine ammunition chests blown up, two officers killed, one wounded, seven enlisted men killed, 38 wounded. And in Hazard's Artillery Brigade, the Artillery Brigade of the Second Corps, Woodruff's battery to the north of us, here where we started, 70 dead horses in a 50 yard square. The brigade overall, 250 dead horses, 149 men lost. Cushing, Woodruff, Rory, Brown, and Arnold. And Arnold was the battery just right up there. Five batteries consolidated into three. In the area near the National Cemetery with the 11th Corps artillery because it too suffered from that crossfire we mentioned. Osborne wrote, I lost in battle about a hundred horses. I sent out the quartermaster sergeants of all the batteries with instructions to take from the citizens their horses, required to give receipts for them. The receipts were given and the government soon after paid $125 for each horse without inquiring as to its market value. It was a good sale for some, a bad sale for others. <laughs> General Hunt, the chief of artillery for the feds later commented, the enemy's superiority in the number of guns was fully matched by the superior accuracy of ours 
and a personal inspection enables me to state with certainty that his losses in material were equal to ours while the marks of the shots in the trees, which was the way they judged back in those days, bear conclusive evidence of the superiority of our practice. But it all comes down to how they were used, what the benefit was that each side gained. And this was that debate that would go on for years and years. General Hancock complained about a feeble fire of artillery. Hancock says, within 700 yards of our position, a feeble fire of artillery was opened, but with no material effect and without delaying its determined advance. General Hunt's response, why was this? Because under his orders, the artillery of his corps had thrown away in an utterly useless cannonade every round of its long range ammunition and therefore could not open on the advancing troops until they came within canister range of his 12 pound batteries. He complains that I had ordered all the artillery of both the second corps and the artillery reserve to withhold its fire. That is true and it was with the object of making the advancing troops pass through not a feeble fire of artillery, if they could indeed do that, but a heavy crossfire from the whole line from the first moment of their advance and before they came under our infantry fire. His counter orders resulted in the artillery fiasco he describes and moreover in a fearful loss of life and a narrow escape from defeat. One of the things that's interesting I think about the Confederates is their almost Indian-like psychology of counting coup. You know, running up to your enemy, touching them with a stick, and then running away. You don't actually have to defeat them, you just have to pull that psychological something on them. It's good if you can beat them, but if you can count coup on them, then you too have done something to them. And by, by, by being able to come up and actually touching the wall, you've done something. Hunt would envision that and describe it this way. He said, had my orders been fully carried out, I think that their whole line would have been, as half of it was, driven back before reaching our position. As it was, the splendid valor of Pickett's division alone enabled the Confederates, though defeated, to preserve their morale intact. Had they been repulsed without coming into immediate contact with our men, their morale would have been seriously impaired, their sense of superiority humbled. You know, there was a Confederate officer who once said, Confe uh, Confederate infantry and Yankee artillery together could whip the world. And of course, here as elsewhere, that did not happen. And with that thought, I close the program.